Hello everyone, this is Chris Peterson here, bringing you another game and commentary. Um, I was going through some old score sheets that I had saved up from tournaments that I played in over the years, and I came across uh, a few games from the Colorado Open in 2007. And I played in the under 1800 section of that tournament because I was um, just under 1800, I was like 1773 uh, during that tournament. and. Um, Yes, yeah, so some of the games were pretty interesting, some of them were not, so um, I'll go ahead and show you some of the games that were interesting, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, this game, the first game I'm going to show you is from round three, it was against a guy named Leonardo Sotaradano. Um, I believe he is from the Philippines, I'm not, not sure, uh, but awesome name, Leonardo. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's 1766 at the time, I think... He's probably an A player by now, but he's a very strong player. And, um, yeah, so round three, first round, I, the first round score sheet I didn't have, and round two is not interesting at all, because uh, it was between me and a friend, and we just were kind of goofing off. Um, so, um, yeah, so E4, D5, um, I am black, he is white, and as you can see, it's the Scandinavian, something I don't usually play. Uh, my friend Robert is a big fan of it, but I have, like, no theoretical knowledge of it at all. Um, after knight f6, uh, there's a few options. After d4, um, bishop g4 would be the Portuguese variation. Um, c4, e6 would be the, um, some gambit. Can't, I can't remember the name of the gambit, but it's, it's a gambit. Um, but, um, he opted to play bishop b5 and check. So bishop b5 check, and after bishop d7, um, I didn't want to play c6, pawn takes c6, because that would be a gambit. And I, and I was, uh, since I don't have theory behind this, I don't really want to play into a gambit if I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So um, bishop d7, and now he goes back to bishop e2, and you might be asking, why did he do that? Well, he wasted a tempo by putting his bishop out and bringing it back, but at the same time, my bishop is now misplaced. It's blocking my queen and my knight, so I have to move it uh, to get my other pieces out of the way anyway. So he's kind of trading tempo, a tempo now for a tempo later when it might be more important. Um, so after knight takes d5, I get my pawn back. And after d4, he's claiming the center and e6. I don't want to move my bishop out right away. Well, definitely not to there, but to like f5. Um, mostly because um, we have like a nice developmental equilibrium where I'm a half a half tempo ahead of him as far as getting my pieces out, um, and I don't really want to waste it by moving my bishop out. Um, so knight f3, c5, and I want to open it up a little bit so that my bishops have um, some stuff to do. I like my bishops a lot, so that's kind of the reason behind c5, and also I can get my knight to c6 without hindering my queen side at all. Uh, after pawn to c4, he is attacking my knight, and he's going to push d5, and uh, kind of closes it up just a little bit, and it, well, it's going to be kind of an interesting dynamic here. So after d5, pawn takes d5, pawn takes d5, uh, now he has this isolated queen pawn, uh, but it is past pawn, and it's only three squares from queening. Um, so this could be either a crutch for him, or it could be a very powerful weapon later on. Um, and I try to turn it into a crutch by putting my bishop on d6. Um, so I'm blockading it with my bishop, um, but the best blockader is a knight. So if I can get a knight there, that would be better, but um, for now I'll just settle for a bishop since it's early in the game still. We both castle, just getting our king to safety. Uh, after bishop g5, he puts me in this kind of an awkward pin for me. I Looking back, I think I probably should have played h6 before castling, but, um, yeah, but anyway, I, I'm in this pin, and it's kind of awkward for me to get out of, because I have to move my bishop out of the way, and then move my knight, and then my queen has a chance to run, run to wherever to get out of the pin. So it's going to take me three moves to get out of this pin, and it's going to be, uh, pretty, pretty nasty. Uh, so step one is to get my bishop out of the way, so I play bishop g4. h3, just kind of like... I don't know, winning a tempo, gaining space for the king. Yeah. I'm not usually a big fan of the h3 moves unless it actually does something tangible. Um, yeah, so I guess putting the bishop here is a little different. I, I'm not I'm not too sure why he would play h3. It just seems like he just did it for later on in the game. 
So um, after bishop h5, um, he he plays knight c3. And now I have I have two problems. I have this problem of knight b5 and of uh, knight e5. So his knight could go to either of those squares. Um, if I allow his knight to go to b5, um, I'm going to lose my dark square bishop. Uh, well, he'll trade it for the knight, probably. Uh, because if I go bishop e7, then d6 traps my bishop, and that would be no good. So um, I can't allow uh, knight b5 to happen, so I played a6. Um, but by playing a6, I'm kind of uh, ruining my kingside pawn structure a little bit. And because after knight knight e5, I still can't play bishop e7 because of d6, and um, I can't play bishop e5 because of this knight. So I come up with a, a neat little way to try to maintain my pawn structure, and that is bishop takes f3. Now, um, after bishop takes f3, he has several options. He could play knight takes knight, check. He could play bishop takes knight, um, or he could play bishop takes f3. And those are his best three choices. Um, if he played bishop takes f3, but I think um, a slightly a slightly stronger variation for him would be knight takes knight, because after knight takes knight, I pretty much have to play pawn takes, and after bishop h6, bishop takes e2, queen takes e2, he has this powerful threat of queen g4 check, so I I'm losing my rook anyway, and my my pawn structure is all messed up on the king side. Um, so I'd have to play a move like king h8, or queen d7, or queen c8 to try to uh, stop him from checkmating me. Um, and what ends up happening is, let's say king h8, bishop takes, queen takes. Um, I have two pieces for a rook. Um, pawns are equal, but my pawns are messed up on the king side, and he has this pass pawn. Um, I think with the bishop and knight, I can maintain a blockade on this pawn, or potentially win it later on. Um, so I have a very strong potential of actually um, turning this into a draw, or or even a win later on. But um, right now, um, with the position being basically open, my kingside pawn structure in shambles, uh, it's going to be a very difficult game for me either way. So that that is one potential way that could go. Um, but the way he played it is also very strong, because um, I'm still in that pin, it's still difficult for me to get out of, um, but he's not ruining my pawn structure. Uh, he plays bishop takes f3, and now I play bishop e5, and after bishop e5, uh, I'm trying to maintain my, I'm able to maintain my pawn structure a little bit, so, uh, well, it'll be completely intact the way it is now, so, uh, it, it was kind of a trade-off for him. Does he want to go into the two pieces for a rook um, with my messed up kingside pawns, or does he want to maintain the pressure and uh, not mess up my pawns at all? And I think he made um, a wise decision. Um, it could have gone either way. Um, I'm sure with proper play, the, um, the latter way, the messing up pawn structure way, is probably um, not nearly as good. But um, it's an interesting dynamic for um, for B players to have to deal with. So, uh, so now after Queen B3, he is threatening my my B7 pawn. So I play Knight B to D7, and the idea behind this is if he takes this pawn, uh, I play Rook B8 and I take his B pawn. 